Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Sarah Birch on the subject of sustainable cities. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Thompson. I'm an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and a senior fellow here at the Center for International Governance Innovation. Every week, we're joined by an expert in global governance or international public policy here to the studio in Waterloo. Today, my guest is Dr. Sarah Birch. She is a senior fellow here at CG as well and the Canada Research Chair in Sustainability, Governance and Innovation at the University of Waterloo. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. So, uh, in the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, we saw the world agree to a pretty ambitious target of containing global warming to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. What does this mean for cities? Well, the talk has always been, where is this boundary between what's safe and what is dangerous uh, levels of climate change? Right. And the mark in the past has typically been around two degrees. That's kind of what we've held up as this boundary or this threshold that we don't want to cross. But in Paris, um, for the first time, a real discussion started happening around 1.5, which is an even more ambitious than right. 2. And I think many scholars around the world would say uh, keeping warming within 2 degrees itself is optimistic. So 1.5 requires some pretty transformative levels of greenhouse gas reduction and also adaptation responding to those impacts of climate change around the world. So the level of ambition got ratcheted up. Right. And more countries around the world agreed to that than ever before. So it was this sort of universal binding agreement that really gave um, a lot of momentum to, to climate change responses around the world. And maybe we could just pick up on this, this point about transformation. Mm -hmm. And you've argued that climate change can actually serve as a catalyst for transformative sustainability within cities or for cities. What do you mean by this? What I mean by that is that reducing greenhouse gas emissions, responding to climate change, isn't the only thing that we care about, surely, right. in our communities. There are so many other issues that matter, biodiversity, social equity, poverty, um, uh, maternal care, you know, all, all sorts of issues. So what we need uh, to do is figure out ways to look at cities, look at communities as whole systems, right. and push those systems towards a healthier, more sustainable state. And climate change being this imperative, this incredibly um, uh, powerful challenge that we know we're facing, that we have to respond to quite quickly, um, it, it gives us an avenue through which we can then discuss all of those other things and how to do them at the same time. Right. So. What we need to do in cities is just be smarter about how we respond to this kind of constellation of global challenges and find ways to respond to climate change that delivers on those other things too. Instead of just reducing greenhouse gas emissions, can right. we also create beautiful recreational spaces that allow people to get outside, get healthy, or get moving, um, that also creates healthy ecosystems so we enhance biodiversity. So climate change is that lever, it's that sort of entree into a deeper form of sustainability in our communities. Right, and you've also argued that cities need to really take a two-pronged approach, that they need to deal with the question of mitigation of greenhouse gas, but also adaptation. Mm -hmm. Could you just explain the difference between the two terms and maybe comment on um, which is easier for cities? I mean, uh, wh sure. what is the low-hanging fruit here? Right, well, so, um, for better or worse, we've traditionally uh, separated these two types of responses to climate change, one being mitigation, right. uh, and we use that word very specifically in the climate change realm. It might mean something different in um, hazardous waste or remediation, but for, right. for climate change folks, uh, mitigation means reducing greenhouse gas emissions or enhancing the capacity of the planet to sink carbon, to suck up carbon and store it. So that's the mitigation side. On the other side is adaptation, and that means responding to the impacts of climate change, which are already happening and we right. know will continue to happen. So how do we protect our communities um, so that the impacts of sea level rise, of changing precipitation patterns, drought, all of these other impacts of climate change um, are less uh, dangerous for people and for ecosystems? So we have these two sets of responses, mit mitigation and adaptation. Um, but the reality is that they overlap in so many different ways. And right. communities need to, um, if they are to pursue a sustainable path and reach this, this goal, um, 
the, the ideal is to um, pursue both adaptation and mitigation simultaneously and find those strategies that are efficient and effective at doing both. Um, mitigation has tended to be the preferred or the, the first line of attack. Right. Um, and this is a <clears throat> partly a historical artifact. You know, when we first started learning about climate change um, as a scientific and policymaking community, we um, said, okay, how do we deal with this? Well, we need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And if we do that well enough, we won't have impacts of climate change to adapt to. Right. But we soon learned that, of course, we weren't doing it fast enough and we were committed to some level of warming. So adaptation is required. So adaptation has been a slower growing conversation, I think, and it requires grappling with the science and really understanding what we're in for. Right. Um, so I think we are farther along in some ways in understanding what renewable energy technologies and building efficiency and vehicle efficiency and all of those mitigation strategies, uh, which of those are effective and which ones we have at our fingertips. Adaptation we're still really grappling with. You right. know, what impacts can a community expect to see in 50, 20, 50, 100 years? Um, who gets to decide how we respond to those impacts? Who's at the table making those decisions? So um, both are required, but we're, we're learning pretty fast, I think. Right. About how to now, do it. there are some cities that get it, yeah. and Malmo, Sweden, Freiburg, Germany, even here at home, North Vancouver. What are these cities doing to really um, put them at the forefront of, uh, of this transformation that you're calling for? Mm -hmm. I think there's a number, number of uh, ingredients to success in those leaders that you mentioned. Um, the first is that many of them take this holistic sustainability lens. So rather than hiving climate change off in its own little silo and, and um, assigning planners or engineers or um, city staff, et cetera, to just climate change, they think, what does a sustainable community look like to us and how can we pursue this in, in, multi in a multitude of ways? So that holistic sustainability lens, I think, has created opportunities for innovation um, that wouldn't have been necessarily obvious if climate change had remained in its silo. Um, so that's one thing that a lot of these communities are doing. Um, another is that they are using really innovative tool sets like ecosystem-based approaches. So can we figure out a way um, to, for instance, build a series of constructed wetlands so that when um, extreme rain events happen, that water can be purified by a natural system can, and that system itself, the wetland, can be um, full of beautiful paths for people to walk and cycle down, so it's a recreation opportunity. Right. It can be um, a biodiversity enhancer. It can do all of these things at once, as I mentioned. It also sinks carbon. It's full of green and growing things that suck up carbon. So ecosystem-based approaches, I think, are one of the most promising set of tools to do both adaptation and mitigation in a really transformative way. <clears throat> and finally, I think that, I mean, there's lots of ingredients to success, but one of the most powerful ones that I've seen is the level of participation. So okay. in these cities, there typically tend to be very deep, ongoing, authentic efforts to get um, many stakeholders around the table to discuss what is feasible in that community, what is desirable. This isn't just a scientific discussion. This is right. a deeply values-based discussion about who wins, who loses, who gets that beautiful wetland, what neighborhood, you know, um, who pays for it, who maintains it. These right. are all political questions and deeply values-based questions. So um, having uh, indigenous knowledge at the table, um, having a variety of, of stakeholders at the table means that the decisions that are made are more legitimate, uh, more robust, and more likely to succeed. Right. Now, I think one of the, uh, the arguments or counter-arguments against action is that it's too costly. Right. It will cost, it will be too expensive, it will cost jobs, it will be v too disruptive. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair argument? Um, I mean, does adaptation have to be really expensive or really disruptive? I think I would describe that as a, as a false dichotomy. Okay. So I think, um, <clears throat> pardon me, it's a caricature of, this, of the situation uh, to say that we have the economy over here and we have the environment over here and you have to care about one um, or the other. Um, and I think there's abundant data to suggest that the costs of doing nothing uh, are dramatic right. and far exceed the costs of doing something um, 
preemptively or proactively. So no, I think that um, by wisely investing in a diversified energy economy, um, as we're certainly seeing here in Canada, um, by wisely investing in proactive adaptation, we are offsetting those costs that we would most definitely face um, in terms of um, energy market volatility and climate change impacts in the future. And the um, the examples of best practices that mm -hmm. we've we've highlighted uh, so in Sweden, Germany, and here in Canada all come from Europe and North America. Are there cities in the developing world that are, are working on this as well and, and having success as well. Sure, yeah. Um, there are incredible examples all around the world in, in the global south or in developing countries, particularly focused on the adaptation side of things okay. um, because we do find that um, communities uh, or nations that are um, that are more impoverished or have fewer, uh, lower capacity to respond to climate change are then more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. They also geographically are just located in extremely vulnerable areas like low-lying countries that are really susceptible to sea level rise and sure. storms and this kind of thing. So um, we're seeing incredible, I mean Durban of course, South Africa is one of the most incredible examples of innovative sustainability actions. We're seeing um, an incredible transition towards renewable uh, biofuels and energy throughout Brazil. So there are certainly examples. And then of course small communities, not just megacities and um, nation level responses to climate change all around the world where um, very small but powerful um, experiments are taking place, transitioning to renewable energy or um, water purification. So there are certainly examples. Right. And we've also seen in the last few years the emergence of these networks of mm -hmm. cities uh, that have been organized around issues of sustainability and climate change. Yeah. Could you say a little bit about these networks and what the members of these networks hope to, to accomplish? Right. So um, traditionally in international law and in the climate change negotiations that happened in Paris under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, the dominant approach internationally has been a nation-to-nation -nation negotiation to agree on a treaty of some variety. That excludes a whole lot of interested parties, um, cities for instance, other stakeholders, communities, etc. So um, to kind of fill that void, to create a voice out of all of that diversity of the thousands of cities around the world that have a stake in responding to climate change, these networks have cropped up, uh, like ICLE is, is one of the most um, effective global networks of cities. Um, to connect cities with like-minded cities that have similar challenges and what this does is it helps those cities to share technology, to share insights. You know, we tried an adaptation plan, now you're about to, what have we learned that could help you? And they actually trade staff, um, you know, send them to their sister city so that they can learn what's going on. So um, those networks have, I think, had a profound effect on the voice that sub-national entities have in um, climate change policy planning right. and also um, I think make real strides towards uh, technology transfer and towards kind of accelerating action. Now um, up until very recently we have had a, essentially a, a deficit of leadership nationally and even internationally um, on questions of, of climate change. Um, are you optimistic that in fact the the real progress is going to happen at the the level of cities that in fact if we are to hit this target of of 1.5 degrees Celsius it will be because cities see transformation as an opportunity and are actually the ones to to deliver uh, I would have had a different answer to this question six or seven months ago right uh, there was indeed a leadership deficit on climate change nationally in in Canada um, I am cautiously optimistic about the, the path that we're on now. Um, as we've seen, um, we have a renewed commitment to creating a federal and national level um, price on carbon. Right. Um, of course, we have provincial level um, experiments in carbon pricing, a very successful experiment. I, I think it's perhaps, uh, it warrants a, a more established term than experiment now, but in British Columbia uh, for since 2008, you know, th there's been a price on carbon there. Ontario, of course, joining a cap and trade with Quebec um, and others. So, um, to some extent, in the absence of federal leadership, provinces and municipalities stepped in to fill the void. 
Um, that void is not so pronounced anymore. So right. there is support from the federal level for communities to innovate and to take steps. With that said, we have to look very carefully at where jurisdiction over emissions actually resides. And at the national level, there is jurisdiction over some sources of emissions, and municipalities have jurisdiction over other sources of emissions. So you, um, most important, I think, to really reaching these ambitious goals is aligning ambition, aligning um, all levels of government from the municipal to the provincial to the federal so that policies are in sync and we're pushing together instead of pulling apart. Mm. And I think that that um, signs are, I think, pointing in, in the right direction in that regard now in Canada. Great. Sarah, this has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you for, for being on the show. Thank you so much. And thank you to our audience for tuning in. Please join us again for another episode of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter.